Let's also give Pasakum, page 101. <clears throat> One of the important and interesting areas of Hilchos Kashrus involves a series of rabbinic zerot instituted by Chazal and specific foods produced or prepared by Gentiles. Pasakum, not eating bread baked by a Gentile. Cholavakum, not drinking milk that was milked by a Gentile. Kvinasakum, not eating cheese produced by a Gentile. And Bishalakum, we've taken care of. And Stamyena, I'm not drinking wine produced, owned, or touched by Gentiles. In each of these cases, there was a specific concern related to distancing ourselves from the Gentiles and or the concern that the food might be non-kosher. And we're going to discuss uh, tonight Pasaku. The Mishnah of Arzara says, Eludvorim shall goim asurim ben isurim isurim hanoah. The following things are prohibited, but it's not prohibited by hanoah. Cholov shechol v'goy, a gentile that milked milk. Ben Yisrael ro eyu, and a Jew didn't see him do it. Vapas v'ashem and shalahem, if they bake bread, and if they make oil, Rebbe Ubezdino Hitir B'Shemin. Rebbe in his Bezdin took away the Gzeira for Shemin. So there's no concept of Shemin Akum. But the Pas Akum remain. The Rambam in uh, the Perish Mishnayas explained the reasoning behind these Gzeira. Rovi Ladvorim Gona Pas Vashlokois Pas is the, the bread, shlokas is cooked foods, the domain and things like them. It was mainly made for, we should stay away from them. We shouldn't marry them. And that's when, when we have a general term, that's what it referred to. The Shach adds that though no such concern applies to absorptions in the vessels used, this does not create trephos, where, as we've learned, uh, the Isser, if it's got glee, if it's got flavor, it gets absorbed by the Kalim. This doesn't extend to that. Since the majority of vessels are not considered Ben Yomo, used within the last 24 hours, as we have learned previously, we learned that Stam Kalim of non Jews. Are Eina Ben Yomo. If it's Eina Ben Yomo, it's Nois and Tam Livkam, and there's no Isser there. Mishum Chastos or Mishum Geula of the Kachavim. But if something is pro, like Chazer or Nevela, some kind of pro, pro, prohibited food item that gets absorbed into a pot, Lekelam Echush, the Stam Klam Eina Bnei Yonman, which we already learned, that in general, if you, let's say you buy a clean, you don't know what it is from a non Jew. Stam Kalim are not are considered that they have not been used within 24 hours. Since any uh, flavor that's been absorbed in a pot beyond 24 hours, it doesn't usher anymore. So then you don't have to worry about uh, th these issues regarding their Kalim. Now, the Gemara explains that the reason for the decree prohibiting the consumption of bread baked by Gentiles is due to intermarriage. Rashi explains the concern as follows, that a person should not frequently have parties with a Gentile, lest his eyes fall upon his daughter. Based on this, the halach of Pasakum applies even when the bread is certainly kosher. It had to do with societal gzera, not kashrus. And the Shulchan Aruch codifies this rule, and the Ramah adds that once the decree has been set in place, it takes effect everywhere, even in specific cases where there is no concern of intermarriage. Said the Shulchan Aruch, Yoridei Akuf Yud Beis, Osur Chachom Lecho Pas Shel Amomim Oivdei Avod Azor Mishum Chastos. You can't eat bread baked by Oivdei Avod Azor because of intermarriage. Says the Ramah, Mafil B'Mokam Delecha Mishum Chastos Osur. Even if there is no concern of Chastos, it still remains Osur. The law Osur Lepas Shel Chameshes Minei Dogon. That's bread made out of the five grains. Of a partial kidneys, bread made from legumes, vishal oyers vidoichim, or rice, or rice, or millet, eno bechlal pas stam shaasu. They don't fall under the category of pasaku. 
And the Shulchan Aruch clarifies that bread includes only five grains, not bread made of other ingredients. The Pischei Tshuva adds another important point, that since the degree was based on the concern of intermarriage, it does not apply to a non-religious Jew. Chasnus, ayin bayar heitev, ayin b'sefer tifres l'moshe, because of the passhel mumer, shori, if a Jew who's not shomer Shabbos, who violates Shabbos before Heskia, or he eats trefis, he's a mumer. There is no gzera that you can't eat bread baked by them because you might intermarry because there there is no there is no there is no prohibition to marry them. The Afal Pishachot Yisraelu. And you can marry his daughter. So there is no Indian of Pas Akum as it relates to a non religious Jew. The Yalkut Yosef clarifies further that although the Shulchan Aruch refers to idol worshippers, Pas Akum applies to all Gentiles and not, idol, not just idolaters, since intermarriage is forbidden with all of them. The issue of intermarriage, you can't marry any Gentile, whether they're of the Avodah or not. So the Yaakov Yosef clarified that it's not referring just to, because you might have said, well, today the Muslims are not Oyvdei Avodah Certain Shittas hold that Christianity, although most of the, most of the post can say that it is Avodah There are those that say that it's just Shituf. So they, they might say, oh, there's a leniency. They're not considered Oyvdei Akum. We can eat their bread. So the Yaakov Yosef clarifies, Pas Balabai is Goy. We're going to see in a minute why Balabai is, meaning not a baker. The bread baked by a householder, a non-Jewish householder, Shasrul Yisrael. It's also for a Jew, Enchiluk the Zebin Goy Notsri, Sha'ovid of Zora. You see how the, because the Yalkut Yosef follows his father, the Ovadia Yosef, that said that Christianity is about a Zora. To uh, an, an, a Muslim that doesn't is not considered of the Avodah but there's his past would be considered pasakum. We're not allowed to marry them. So although the rule of pasakum appears from the sources so far to be absolute, the Gemara of Avodah Zorah distinguishes between two types of bread. One is more lenient than the other. Bread of a baker, paspalter. That's bread that is baked with the purpose of selling it to the public. The Gemara implies that one may be lenient regarding such bread, where there is no bread by, baked by a Jew available. Number two, bread baked by a private person. This is bread baked in a private home that is not supposed to be sold. In these cases, it's usually forbidden. Says the the Gemara Masech of Zara, Rav Yosef, the Tem Rav Shmuel Bar Yudah Omar, Lo Kachay Amaisa El Onru Pamachas Halach Rabbi Lemalkam Echad. Rabbi once traveled somewhere, the Ra'a Pas Dachul the Talmidim. He found there wasn't enough bread for the Talmidim. Omer Rabbi, Ein Kan Palter. Rabbi said, What do you mean? Is there no non-Jewish baker in town? Kisfor Naam Loim or Palter Goy. So the people who heard this, Rabbi say this, understood that he meant a non-Jewish baker. But really, he referred to, isn't there a Jewish baker in town? And even the one who held, that when Rabbi asked about a palter, he was referring to a non-Jewish palter. He didn't give a leniency a permella de leka palti Yisrael. If there was a Jewish baker in town, he would not give a leniency to use a non Jewish baker. Abu Bamakam, take her palti Yisrael law, he wouldn't allow it. But if there was no palti Yisrael, if there was no Jewish baker in town, and there was a non Jewish baker, so the Chura Rebbe would permit this. Now, again, of course, we're talking about as long as the ingredients have been certified kosher. But then, there's no issue of chasnos because a, a baker that's selling to the public, he's not, gonna, he's not inviting you to his home, means a balabayas who bakes bread at home, invites you to his home, then you're going to meet his daughter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that, the xerim shum chasnos doesn't, isn't applicable by a paspalter. 
So as long as the ingredients were kosher, it seems that that's what Rebbe was referring to. So it's unclear from the Gemara whether Rebbe allowed Pas Paul to break by a non-Jewish baker when necessary or not. It's not that clear. According to Rabbi Yosef, the people interpreted the comments of, Rabbi, of Rebbe as permitting Pas Palter when Pas Yisrael Jewish bread was unavailable. But Rav Yosef himself claims that Rabbi Yosef did not truly subscribe to this leniency. Nevertheless, Rav Chelbo then states that those who do allow Pas Palter allow it only when bread by a Jew is not available, which may imply that he accepts the interpretation of the people. So if this distinction between home-baked bread and bread baked by a baker is accepted, it would seem that the reason is that there's more familiarity between the parties leading to mingling and intermarriage when eating bread baked in a home as opposed to bread that was baked for sale purposes, where there's no personal connection between the parties and the concern of intermarriage is greatly reduced. It should be noted, says the footnote, that this entire discussion whether bread baked by a job top may be permitted assumes that all the ingredients of the bread which are certified kosher. Nowadays, nearly all breads contain many other ingredients as well. Plus the trays used are often smeared with non-kosher animal fat. <laughs> Therefore, one may not consume bread without certification in most cases, right? So, you know, we're talking about old country bread that used to have a hexer or whatever breads that you see an OU on or whatever. So it may not be pas Yisrael because it's owned by a Jew and a Jew didn't turn on the heat or whatever, we'll see, whatever the, the ways we get around it. Let's say it's completely, you know, made by Gentiles, but according to the, the opinions that hold that pas is allowed to be used when there's no Jewish bread, the ingredients have to be certified kosher by the, by the, uh, by the certification agencies. The Rambam and the Ran, in fact, do accept the interpretation of the people of Chalbo, that where there is no Jewish baker, one is permitted to buy kosher bread from a non-Jewish baker, if one, as long as one has verified that the ingredients are kosher, since bread is the main staple food of most meals. Says the Rambam, this is now in the uh, Yara Chazaka, in Hilchas Macholos Asuros, Avot Yishasu Pas Goyim, Yesh Mekomo Shemekilim Bedavar, Velochim Pas Anach Tumagoy, there are places that are needed, and purchase baker's bread, there was no Jewish baker. Let's say you weren't even in the city. You're out in the field. You could do it. But a non-Jew lives in the house. There's no leniency. If it was permitted to eat bread baked by non-Jew, you'd go, you'd be, in, you, you'd accept invitations to his house. You would begin socializing with him. And that's the, the whole reason why Chazal uh, prohibited this in the first place. The Shulchan Aruch also mentions the same leniency that some practice of forbidding Paspalta when Paspalta is available. The Ramo then clarifies that the definition of Paspalta depends upon the purpose of the bread rather than who made it. Therefore, a private homeowner who baked a small amount of bread to sell is considered a palter. And a baker who bakes bread at home for his family is considered a homeowner. So the hector refers to bread that is baked in order to sell. That's going to be the way the Ramah understands paspal. This is a shokonar. This is a shokonar. The Shulchan Aruch, the Rav Yosef Karu seems to be repeating the Rambam, the verbatim. He basically quotes the Rambam. Says the Rambam, Pas Balabais is called Pas Balabais when he bakes it for his family. If a private non-Jew baked bread for sale to the public, then mikri palter. If a non-Jewish baker bakes bread for his family, they would also call, be called pas palabais. The shach explains that the halach of pas is more lenient than that of bishul akum, cooked foods prepared by Gentiles, which we learned about in last year 
where we do not find any distinction in the classical sources concerning a non-Jewish professional cook. We didn't have uh, some kind of leniency when we talked about Bishul Akum, uh, that, oh, if, if it's sold by a, you know, somebody who sell, makes food and sells it, we didn't have that. We had different leniencies. If it was raw, if the, not, if the Jew pr participated in the cooking, right? So Yesh B'Komet says, says the Shach Lo Dami, the Shloko, specifically Kufi Gimel the Lonag, who had to be Shemako. There, there was no heter based on who's cooking it. And what, why is, why were, why were Chazam more lenient for God because of bread? Dalapas Yichia Adam. People live, bread is the staple of life. V'shayich Beitam Ad Yushalmi. The Chaye Nefesh. It provides life. If you throw a wood chip into the fire when you're baking bread, that's enough to make it pas Yisrael. Remember, that was not enough according to many of the shittas that we learned last week about Bishalakum, where you have to stir. You have to either place the food on the, on the fire or you even have to stir it. So the leniency of then. It's not considered pasako anymore. Once you throw a twig into the fire, that's only by pas. So some were shown him were even more lenient than the Rabbi Shulchan Aruch and permitted pasako even when there is bread baked by Jews available. The reason for this is that in their opinion, the prohibition did not spread through the prohibition of pasako didn't spread throughout the entire Jewish people. And this is how Tosfus of Adazar learned. There must be, there's another Mandamar who permits it. Because in one of the circuits it says bread that wasn't matir bebezdin, mechlal de iboy, that if the bezdin wanted it, havashari lay, they could have permitted it. Amaloi poshat isr. The Yisra didn't spread everywhere. We can't some chwa telech lo pashal goyim. Kivin shlo pashat Yisra b'chol Yisrael. That's why there are people who will eat baker's bread made by Gentiles because the Yisra didn't spread. V'yesh li smok chadiv rab shim gam liel. V'lez rab tzarek to amri ain't goyzim gzer lo tzibur. Elim ken rovat tzibur yichon lamad bo. And Chazal cannot make gzer if it's clear that the public can accept. So this position of Tosfis which is held by many other Rishonim, is brought down by the Ramah, who clarifies that one may be lenient even when Pas Yisrael is available. Shari. That's, he's quoting the Beis Yosef according to Mordechai, and the Smak, Smak, the same of Mrs. Cotton, Agos Oshri, who's a major Rishon, and Rabbi Yisrael Israel in the Mari, Agos Dura. And the Isra Heter Ha'aruch. So these are major Rishonim that uh, the Ramah says you can rely on, that you can, you can buy Pas Palter even when there's Jewish bakeries in town. The Beis Yosef, in his commentary on the tour, adds, though, that even those who hold that the decree was not accepted universally, agree that the bread of a private homeowner is always forbidden. The only leniency where we said it's permitted is when a baker. The Gemara Palter is skewed, because it was mentioned in the Gemara. And the Menam of Yushami, Palter. And Valabai is, if a Jew lives in a town where there is no uh, non Jewish baker, and there's only non Jews who bake bread at their home, even if the Jew has nothing else to eat, Osir, Elam Kim Shum Sakonis Nefesh, unless it comes to a Pikuach Nefesh situation. The Shach writes that ideally one should not rely on the Hetar of the Ramon. Rather, one should follow the ruling of Shulchan Aruch not to buy bread from a non Jewish baker if there's a Jewish baker in the vicinity. So, this is an important Shach. We'll see what that means. 
not just in the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, because we're going to see there's a stringency. That the Shach is commenting that really, says the Shach, one should be careful all year. He says, unless the bread is of better quality, the Az Shori. So let's say the Jewish baker made very poor bread and you could get better quality bread from a non-Jewish baker, then he considers that as if there is no Jewish baker. And that would be a leniency for the Shah. So what's the accepted practice nowadays concerning Pasach? So in Eretz Yisrael, the practice of the Rabbanot is to follow the Shulchan Aruch and the Shach. Therefore, all bread baked in Israel is supposed to be Pas Yisrael. Remember, because we learned the Shulchan Aruch said that you should, it's only the Ramah that brought the leniency of Pas Palter. But the Shulchan Aruch said you should rely on, he quoted the Rabbah. What is this? He said, Yesh Vakobosh Mekilin. Um, but the shach is very clear what he's saying. Therefore, all bread baked in Israel is supposed to be Israel. In the diaspora, although some are stringent, it seems that the widely accepted practice in many places is to be lenient based on the Ramah and to permit Pasaku. This is the position of the OU and many other kosher agencies that Paspalter produced by a non-Jewish company may be certified as kosher, provided the ingredients are kosher. The Shulchan Aruch recommends that even those who are lenient about Pas Akum during the rest of the year should nevertheless attempt to be stringent about it during the Aser Simei Tshuva. Says the Shokhanach, Af Mishen and Nizr Mipashal Goyim, Aser Simei Tshuva Tzorach Li Zohir. Says the Mishnah Bura, Aser Simei Tshuva Tzorach Li Zohir, Hainu, Afilu Mipas Palter Shul Goyim. The Mishnah Bura explained to us that it meant even those people who eat uh, you know, non pasakum bread, not pas Yisrael bread, pasakum. The rest of the year during Aser Simei Tshuva, I once heard Rabbi Kraus in one of his uh, pre Rosh Hashanah pre Yom Kippur discussions. I mean, what kind of what kind of halacha is that? I mean, all year you eat it, and now you don't eat it. I mean, I mean, like, what does that what what does it mean? So he he referenced it like it's a it's like a win showcase of, that means between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, it's like we have a show window, like, like Macy's on Fifth Avenue in the holiday season, you know, they decorate their windows. So this is our chance to show Hashem. It's like our show window uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. You know, we, we are signing on, you know, to his army during this period of time. And, and even though, yeah, we can't hold on during the rest of the year, but, you know, at least now, you know, and I'm sure there's other explanations as well. What is the halacha in cases where even no pas palter is available? Is there any leniency to allow pas akum of a private owner? Although a number of the sources we saw above claim no one permits pas akum in that case, the Shulchan Aruch notes that some commentaries do allow eating home baked bread where no other options are available. Yeshmi she'oimer, the makom she'ain palter matsui klau. Means if there's no non Jewish baker and you can't bake bread yourself, you could eat bread as long as the ingredients were kosher from a balabayas. Says the Ramah, you don't have to wait. You know, there's a shipment coming in in a month of kosher bread. You don't have to wait. The gra explains why are we makel here. Snan machilin the achsanya d'mai. The achsanya was when the Roman legions would come into town so they would be garrisoned in Jewish homes. Or if there were guests and these are Jewish guests. You could feed them demai. Demai is Suffolk, uh, Meister Suffolk Truma has not been given if you buy it from an Amaret. So the din is technically you have to give Meister and Truma again. But you could feed, you could feed the Achsanya demai. 
the Amir and Sham Yusham I feel Achsan Yisrael, even if it's a Jewish guest. Do the Dutoichik if it's a pressing need. Right? The Mai is the rabbinic decree that required people to assume that some types were not taken, some of which at the time were somewhat lax about. The Gros is explaining that since it's a rabbinic stringency, the sages were lenient. And since the whole issue of Pasakum is a rabbinic stringency, you can be lenient. That's how the Gros explains. Thus, the Gros explains that just as it's permitted for a traveler who will otherwise go hungry to eat Mai, so too it's permitted to consume Pasakum if necessary. There's an important leniency that is relevant even for those who eat or only certified Pasi Israel baked goods. According to Maravad Zora, even if a Jew took part in the baking process in a very minimal way, such as turning on the fire or even throwing in a small piece of wood, the bread is considered Pas Yisrael. So, Am Ravina Hilchasai rips the sugar akum v'afa Yisrael. The non-Jew lit the fire, but the Jew baked it, or vice versa. Inami sugar Yisrael, the Jew lit the fire v'afa akum, or Inami sugar akum v'afa akum, v'as Yisrael v'chata b'chitui. The, 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 the non-Jew turned the fire on. The non-Jew baked it. Comes the Jew and he just stirred the coals a little bit. Shapir Dami. So of course this is, and that's called Pas Yisrael. That's called Pas Yisrael. And this ruling is codified by the Shulchan Aruch. If the non-Jew lit the oven, but the Jew baked the bread. Oh, vice versa. The Jew lit the fire. Even if he threw one little twig, hitter kola pashabo, it's all considered pas Israel. The whole thing is just to show that the that their pas is also. Okay. Any comments, questions? Aros. Does he give me the give me some lemonade if it's not good? Okay, so we can go on to Cholavakum. Oh, thank you. No, Susie, I'd like the lemonade. There's some cold water in the refrigerator. You can make my lemonade. The second gzer that we will discuss is Cholavakum, not drinking milk that was milked by a Gentile. The sages prohibited drinking milk that was milked by a Gentile. Only if a Jew did not observe the milking. In this case, though, as opposed to the law of Pasakum, the reason for the prohibition given by the Gemara is not related to concern for intermarriage. Since drinking milk together does not usually lead to exceptional intimacy with the one who made it. Rather, here, the reason is due to the concern that the Gentile mixed milk from a non-kosher animal, such as a camel or pig, into the cow's milk. What, why, why should it be a problem with milk of a non-Jew? Do you think they're going to switch non-kosher milk for kosher milk? Milk from a kosher animal is white. Tome, milk from a pig or a non-kosher animal is yarruk, is green. So you can tell the difference by looking at it. Now, maybe they're going to mix it, and therefore you can't tell the difference. Nikum. What you can do is let the milk stand and see if it will harden. So if, it's, if there's chalav tome there, it won't harden. So there's a test to make sure that it's not mixed. So the Gemara says, eat a cowboy lagvina, fine. If the purpose of this milk was to make cheese, so then hachanami. But what about regular drinking milk? Hachamai askina, the cowboy lay, the cowboy lay likimakama. That means just you want to use the milk as an ingredient to add to a certain food, like kutach, which is like a mayonnaise. So there you're not going to need it to curdle. 
So the Gemara says, so, so do a test. Take a little piece away. Take, take some of the volume away. Let it stand and see if it hardens. Because there are other aspects of the milk, the way, that also will, will not harden. So it can't, it's not a perfect test. Uh, even though maybe this part that you're making for cheese curdled, but the other part may be still have non-kosher milk in it. So according to the Gemara, although non-kosher milk has a distinctly different appearance than kosher milk, concern still exists that non-kosher milk was mixed in together with kosher milk. And even, even though one could theoretically attempt to curdle it to determine whether it is non-kosher, since non-kosher milk does not curdle, this would still not conclusively clarify the makeup of the mixture since there's always some way that does not curdle in milk, and this could be from the non-kosher milk as well. So the Rambam quoting this Gemara in discussing the reason behind the decree of Cholav Achim. Cholav ain't a nikfe. Cholav of a, of a non-kosher animal will not coagulate. V'oymik cholav and it won't stand the same way like, like kosher milk. V'im nisarim cholav to cholav they get mixed. The, 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 only the kosher milk will coagulate. And the non-kosher milk with its way will flow out of the cheese and it'll be a mixture, kosher, non-kosher. So, so we see the main problem with Chalav Akum is having non-kosher milk put in there. So the Shulchan Aruch records the halacha very briefly. Chalav shechal v'goy, ben Yisrael ro'ehu, and the Jew doesn't, is not monitoring the milking, osur, shema iriv bo chalav tamik. Maybe he, the non-Jew mixed in non-kosher milk. Says the Ramah, chalav shel goyim, o yisaris kelim shniz bashlam kishar yisar. This will aser, this will prohibit kalim if you cooked this milk in it because it's, it's non-kosher. A non-kosher milk from a pig is non-kosher. And therefore the blia, if, it, if the absorption goes in the kli, the kli becomes aser. Now, if you bought milk from a non-Jew, it's not vadai that there is Tommy milk, there's only a suffix. I will be saying rock suffix. But Shami Ira got over Tommy, the Hank Vino Sayam. But this is this is suffix Doraisa, because Kalayots in the Tommy Tommy. And therefore, uh, the, the milk is osser, the pots are osser, and their cheeses are osser. So let's now discuss some of the details. What does this mean? The Jew has to see the milking. Does this mean he actually has to see it? Or is it enough that the Jew is nearby and the Gentile knows that the Jew is nearby and could have, could have seen it, such that the Gentile would not attempt to add in non-culture milk because he might be discovered and lose his parnasa. This is a very common concept in Ashgacha, whether or not you have to be there permanently or whether you can be Yotzev and Nichnas. As long as, you're, as long as the Gentile knows you're somewhere around, and you could pop in and make a surprise visit, that's what is being asked here. Is that enough here? So the Gemara addresses this issue and explains that the Jew was standing outside and had the ability to watch the milking at any time. Even if he may not have actually seen it in reality, the milk is classified as Chol of Yisrael, since there's no longer concern that the non-kosher milk was mixed in it, since the Gentile would not do so, where he suspects the Jew may see him. The Jew can sit. What's the show? Hello? The Jew can sit on the side of the flock of the non Jewish sheep or cows, and they're going to milk it. 
He could just be on the side. He doesn't have to be seeing everything. Echidami. Either like at the Bartomi Bedro. Now let's say the, the, the flock only has kosher animals. There's no non-kosher animal there. So pshita, I mean, there's no concern. Now, if there was a pig or a camel there, where, so, and, and the Jew is not looking every second, how can we permit? So the Gemara explains, there is, we're talking about a, a flock that has a non-kosher animal there. And he's, it's, it's, it's capable of being seen. Right, but when he's sitting, he doesn't see it. The Jew isn't perhaps is not in view every second. Since when the Jew sits, he doesn't see. Maybe So are we concerned that maybe when the Jew didn't see it a hundred percent of the time? Even though when he stands, he could see whatever's going on, but if he's sitting, he doesn't see it. But he's capable of seeing it, and the Gentile knows that. Do we have to be concerned that maybe he mixed it? Kamash no. Since at any moment he could see the non-Jew, and the non-Jew knows it. The non-Jew is afraid. He doesn't want to lose his job. And therefore, the Svara is he will not mix it. And therefore comes from this Gemara, the concept that the Jew doesn't have, necessarily have to be watching every second. According to Gemara, if the Jew stands outside, he can see the milking if he stands up. Then the milk is permitted even if he was sitting down. And he can't see. Since the Gentile will be fearful that the Jew will catch him. Can we use this logic of the Gemara to permit Chalabatim if there are other reasons for ensuring that the milk is kosher even if the Jew is not present? The Mordechai brings an opinion that uses this Gemara to prove that where there are no non-kosher animals in the flock, it is permitted to drink the milk, milk by a Gentile, even without the oversight of a Jew. But the Mordechai rejects that position. The Mordechai brings it, but he doesn't hold of it. He quotes the Gemara, that if there was no non-kosher animal in the flock, so it's partial that it would be kosher. The Mordechai says that there are people who prove from this, if it's clear like day, you can buy milk from such a non-Jew, even though a Jew hasn't been mashgiach. Says the Mordechai tells who be other. It's a mistake. The Imken Hayalala Akshos, the Gmor could have asked, if there was no non-kosher animal there, why did the Kamar have to create the case of the Jew sitting on the side of the flock and when he sits, he doesn't see, but when he stands, he sees. If there was a svara, that if there are no non-kosher animals present at all, you don't need any ashgacha, then the Gemara didn't have to require that the non-Jew sit on the side, that the Jew sit on the side of the flock. So if there's no non-kosher animal in the, in the, in the flock, she did the Yosha Mitzad Edrosaki. It's certainly uh, clear that if the non-Jew sits on the side, doesn't see exactly what's going on, that it would be permitted. So according to the Mordechai, the fact that the Gemara requires the Jew to sit outside proves that knowing non, no non-kosher milk was added is insufficient. The presence of the Jew outside is critical. So the Shulchan Aruch, and the Taz rule in accordance with the Mordechai that even where there is no non-kosher animal in the flock, a Jew must be stationed by the side of the flock. Hayechol of Beveso, the non-Jew was milking the animal in his house. The Jew is on the outside. If you know that he didn't have any non-kosher animals there, it's permitted. And says the Ramah, The Jew has to be there in the beginning. The year of the Kli. And look into the Kli that when they started, because we can tell by color that there wasn't some non-kosher milk that they were adding to them. 
says the Taz, means even if you've determined that there are no non-kosher animals there, you need a Jews being there. However, the Ramot does bring a different leniency concerning a case where a Gentile is mil milking cows on the premises of the Jew. In this case, he is leniency if there's no concern of non-kosher milk being mixed in. The Ramah was in Krakow. They had non-Jewish maid servants. Um, there were many Jewish farmers in Poland. Tevye, the milkman, was, uh, was actually in Russia, but you know, it was the same thing in Lithuania and in Poland. So they had maid servants in the Jewish home that were milking the cows or in the corral, over there shall have. It means as long as there isn't a non-Jewish home right next door where it may be non-kosher milk could be obtained, right? You could allow the non-Jewish maid servants to milk it even though there's no Jew there, I will be changed from Israel Klal. The Ma'achas should be based Israel, or Bishkunaso and Lachu should have a Tomei. He's in the Jewish neighborhood. He's in the Jewish house. You don't have to worry that there's some non-kosher milk there. Now, this leniency would seemingly not be applicable in most situations, where the milking takes place on the premises of the Gentile. Despite the limited nature of the Ramos leniency, the pre Chodosh who was a, an Akron commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, developed a leniency that would apply even when the cows are milked in the property of the Gentile. The Prichot suggests that the reason that the Mordechai we saw above was Machmir, that the Jew must be present, even if he cannot see the actual milking, was due to the concern that the Gentile might pour in non-kosher milk that he had inside his own house. Based on this, the Prichot rules that if it could be ascertained that there is no non-kosher milk in the entire vicinity, Chol of Akum would be permitted. Says the pre-Chodesh im Chol of Tomei Eino Nimtza B'Makom, if we know that there is no non-kosher milk, or Shnimtza El Eshu Yoter B'Yokem Echol of Tor, or it's present but it's very expensive, Ein Lesser Chol of Shechal Bogoi, there's no reason to prohibit milk that a Gentile milk and the Yisrael did not see him, he says, you could buy such milk. And here's a biography of the pre -chodosh. Many achroinim agreed with this heter, the pre -chodosh. at least where the custom was already there to be lenient, or non-kosher milk is more expensive. Among them, the Radvaz and the Kafachayim. Here, she'en motzeboi cholov tomek klau, in a city, if it was known that there was no non-kosher milk, you could buy milk that a Gentile milk, then Yisrael Roy, even though the Jew didn't see what was going on. If there is no minig in the city to be lenient, but based on this, if there is a, 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 a minute to be lenient, you could follow it. Says the Kafachayim. In places where there was a leniency, you don't have to protest. And if, if, if in places where non kosher milk was more expensive, then the non Jew is not going to mix it. Not uh, more expensive milk into the less expensive chal of tar. Mutra liknos magoy chal of shechal glorious Israel for an economic reason. He says that's the case today. Uh, some kinds of non kosher milk, camel milk, are more expensive than cow's milk. Says the kafachaim, I feel the makam shechal of tar who most lagoyim. Even where take pig's milk or camel's milk is disgusting to Gentiles, I feel also like no, ma'am. You you still can't buy 
milk from them, even though they personally might not drink it, but they could to increase their profits, they might do it. But so the Kavachim brought opinions that seemed to agree with the Prichadish that there was a leniency to buy milk as long as there was no non kosher milk present or the non kosher milk was more expensive. But many disagreed with the Prichadosh, including the Chasam Sofer and the Orach HaShulchan. They held that the Chachamim did not make a, a, a distinguishing feature when they made this decree. Said the Orach HaShulchan, Ve'en lishol de boil de bartame be'edro lama lanu shia Yisrael yoshev v'chutz it means if there's no non-kosher animal present, why do we have to have the Jews sitting around? That means there's no, what are we worried about? If a Jew didn't see the milking at all, that's how the Orach HaShulchan learns. According to all the opinions, a few of them cloud over time of the year, even though there is no non kosher milk prevalent, but often that there should be no suspicion that it's going to mix with the kosher milk. We call Makam Osir, it's still prohibited. If the Jew is not there watching, like I said before, we, the Goy knows that the Jew comes in. He doesn't have a set schedule. He could pop it any time. That's called Yotze V'Nichnas. Vada Afilu B'Kot Nuktana. And even if it's a, not an adult, Mi'okol Poni Ma Yisra B'Chol Without a Jew somehow being around, it's going to be prohibited. Uli Yetr Se'ez, he will say further, Avor Lecha Eish HaKol Divei Rabuzin HaKadosh Yemen Kegach Le'ez. The words of Chazal were like fire. Mashes vada lefanai lo nishbar. He he believed nishbar. He once would have had a broken heart. Bioti yoshev al kisei or rabbi ir plonis. He was in the bezdin uh, in a certain city. Shechad be balabatim achashuvin. One of the important balabatim sheshama yanoi ketem bedover, who was lenient regarding cholov akum. When he traveled to the big city, the Yosha taught him he did business there. They would put coffee, they'd have coffee, they put milk. How you coin him Khalif Shaman Shakoim Smet right? Smetana, they would buy the fatty fat. That was near their hotel. They investigated. Where did he get this kind of fatty milk? I buy brains of animals. I soak them with milk. I cook it. That's how I get fatty. So he gives a story like that. There are many reasons they gave. He was in Lithuania. He had heard that in America, the Ark died like in 1910. So remember, in 1880, there were millions of Jews from Eastern Europe that already had begun to immigrate to Ellis Island to America. So he had heard that in America, they drink pig's milk. So it, 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 so according to Aruch HaShulchan, the presence of the Jew is required to permit Chalabakum. And an assessment that there is no non-kosher milk in the air is insufficient. The Aruch HaShulchan demonstrates, based on the story that relates that Chazal did not always disclose all the reasons for their decrees, but we must observe them faithfully, even when the more obvious reasons appear not to be relevant. I'm just going to read the footnote. 
From a perusal of the writings of the Poskim from that time, it seems that the more prevalent custom in the majority of communities in Europe in the 1800s was to be machmir in accordance with some soif and the Archa Shulchan. However, that may have changed upon the migration of many Jews to the shores of America and other countries in the Gola, as we will discuss in the continuation of the Shir. The Chazon Ish addresses this question, states, remember the Chazon Ish died in like 1953, lived in Bnei Brak, was the post Kador in Eretz Israel. The Chazon Ish addresses this question, states that the fear of being caught, that means the fear of the Gentile being caught, is parallel to the case of maidservants, even though here the premises is one belonged to the Gentile. And the case of the Jews sitting outside, according to Chazon Ish, in both of these cases, the fear factor is the primary consideration. And therefore, commercially sold milk should be permitted where there is government supervision, right? The government supervises that things that are not supposed to be added to the milk are not added. So, that if the government is checking that they can't put other types of milk in there, and there would be a financial penalty. This is like maids who would milk in a, 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 like the Ramah broad and they're afraid. Similar to the case where one sits by the flock and he sees, that means he's relating government supervision as if the Jew was there. So the Chazonish is Meikul. Many of his contemporary achronim, particularly the Minchas Yitzchak, Yitzchak, the, the Dayan Wise, who was the uh, who was the mashgiach in the Eina Charedis? That's the chazanish to carry chol of akum. She bikuch mem shalti nechshav kisrael omin al gabo. The chazanish wanted to say that governmental supervision is as if a Jew is watching. He says he didn't have to. He shouldn't have brought that. Ki ilu hi alocha psuka, as if this is the final alocha. She yadu asherov a charedim. Because he says in the Haredim, this was somewhere else where, where Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein, the son in law of Rabbi Yashid, brought the opinion of the Chazon Ish as the absolute halacha. And he says, no, because uh, we know that many Haredim. Are careful with kashas going to call so he doesn't understand why they have to bring down the favorish this leniency of of the chazonish. Now, it's now nine o'clock, and we come to probably one of Rav Moshe Feinstein's most famous chuvas. And I want to save that for next week, so we can go into it very, very uh, carefully. This is what all of us relied on. I know in Los Angeles, Sydney will definitely remember, you know, in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't availability of, uh, of, uh, Chol, of Chol of Yisrael. And uh, uh, most Orthodox Jews re relied on this Igris Moshe, at, at least at that time. Of course, later on, Chol of Yisrael became much more prevalent. It became available. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see how that changed. We'll see, therefore, how that changed the halacha, etc. But this, this Shuv of Rav Moshe, we should go into very, very carefully because it was very important for many years. Uh,